Since the earliest days of shipbuilding, engineers have faced a difficult challenge. How to actually get their new creations into the water in the first place. Ships can't just be built in the ocean. They need to be constructed on land and then launched or floated out of a dry dock. The problem is that the process of launching a ship isn't just as simple as shoving it into the water. Complex calculations have to be done to make sure something doesn't go wrong. Unfortunately, through history, a few ship launches have done just that, resulting in minor inconveniences all the way to tragic fatalities. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we'll look at five ship launches that didn't go exactly according to plan. For starters, let's look at a very famous ship launch that had some rather unexpected results for onlookers. September 26th, 1934, and perched high up on the slipway overlooking Clyde Bank, Scotland, was the mighty white hull of the RMS Queen Mary, shortly to become the largest floating object in human history up to that point. The ship's construction had been marred by financial troubles and the Great Depression, but by 1934, the hour had finally arrived and the pride of British shipbuilding was at last ready to take to the water. Queen Mary was absolutely immense. Her hull was 1,019 feet or 310 meters long, and even empty, it all weighed well over 36,000 tons. Once completed, the ship would eventually weigh in at 77,400. Now, the ship had been built to be launched backwards into the Clyde River, but this alone was no simple task. The river itself had to be widened and deepened to accommodate the monstrous ship's hull. If they didn't widen it, then the launched ship would immediately beach itself on the opposite side of the bank. To smoothen the ride and prevent excess friction, hundreds of tons of tallow fat and soap were lathered onto the slipway beneath the ship, and to arrest the hull, hundreds of more tons of heavy drag chains were attached to the hull so that they would bring the ship to a stop once it was afloat. The stage was set, and the hour had at last arrived. Her Majesty, Queen Mary of Tech, revealed the liner's name, and a bottle of Australian wine broke against the hull. Then these big steel triggers were released, and with a rumble, the hull was set free to fall down the slipway and into the river. The whole thing was captured by newsreels and cameramen, and watched by tens of thousands of spectators on all sides of the River Clyde, some in specially designed stands. Those on the opposite side of the river to the launch arguably had the finest view along the entire length of the ship's hull, but then there came an unexpected event. As Queen Mary roared into the river, she displaced nearly 40,000 tons of the Clyde, which needed to go somewhere. It surged up and poured over the riverbank like an enormous tidal wave, catching onlookers completely off guard. Suddenly, a two foot high wave broke over the bank and surged around the spectators' angles, catching some of them off their feet and drenching them completely. Now, it's not known exactly how many people were soaked, but dozens at least were caught by the wave. There were no injuries from the event and many actually found it quite funny, but it shows clearly the impressive physics at play behind the launching of a ship. Queen Mary's launch was ultimately successful, and the chains brought her to a halt, after which tugs came alongside to take her to a fitting out wharf for completion. Now it's a fun little side note in the story of this legendary ship, but history tells us that sometimes waves caused by ship launches could prove extremely dangerous. Now about 36 years earlier, in 1898, a new warship was being readied for launch. She was called the HMS Albion. She was a battleship, one of the newest and most powerful in Britain's fleet. She displaced about 14,000 tons and was about 420 feet or 128 meters long. Impressive for a warship of the age. She had been built at the Thames Ironworks shipyard in London, right on the River Thames itself. Towering over the skyline of small houses and factory chimneys was the huge white hull of the ship and as ever, it caused quite the scene. Thousands came out to see the event, with many lining the decks of nearby ships. Specifically for this occasion though, viewing platforms had been constructed on the Thames around the slipway so guests could see the launch up close and personal. One of these was a wooden stage with support struts built to accommodate just a small party of workmen, but on the day it was burdened by over 200 people. Now incredibly, the launch itself was actually filmed by at least two separate cameramen, giving us a rare glimpse into this special bit of history. Mary of Tech, the actual very same Mary of Tech who'd launched the Queen Mary in 1934, was at that point just the Duchess of York. She launched the Albion, and thousands of pairs of eyes watched on as the ship slipped down into the river. Although this footage looks peaceful, and the launch was indeed a success, it had shocking consequences for the nearly 200 people perched atop on one of the viewing platforms. As Albion hit the water, she too caused a huge wave that rolled over the river and smashed 
into the supports of the stage. The wooden legs gave way and the entire structure crashed down into the water with over a hundred spectators, many of them women and children. The issue was that the cries for help and the sirens were drowned out by the steam whistles which boomed out celebrating the launch of the ship. Eventually the news spread that something had gone horribly wrong and dozens of people were struggling to keep their heads above water. All this in an era when many people couldn't actually swim and woolen clothes, once drenched, weighed an absolute ton. Workmen and spectators dived in heroically to help and they plucked quite a few people out to safety, but in the end nearly 30 people had died, the youngest being just three months old. It was one of the worst Thames peacetime tragedies and resulted in some serious controversy because the footage of the launch, although it had not captured the actual stage collapse, was distributed afterwards, which many saw as poor taste. The footage of the aftermath and the rescue efforts in particular was seen by the Victorian public as poor form, but it actually stands today as one of, if not the earliest examples, of journalism covering a disaster using the film camera. The Thames is no stranger to failed launches though, it had actually played host to another disastrous attempt some years earlier, in November 1857. Now this was probably one of the most ambitious undertakings in all of engineering history, because it had almost no parallel up until that point. Famous engineer Isambard Brunel had worked closely with other engineers and naval architects, notably John Scott Russell, to design and build an absolutely monstrous ship for a time. SS Great Eastern was no less than 18,915 gross registered tons, about five times bigger than the previous biggest ship in the world from just the year prior. That size record would not be surpassed for more than 40 years. Now the issue was the immense ship was clearly decades ahead of its time. Few thought the thing would actually work. The infrastructure required to support a vessel of that size just didn't exist yet. Getting it into the water to begin with would be a huge task. Brunel and his team proposed what should have been a simple solution. No slipway in the world was yet big enough to support Great Eastern. Instead, she'd be built on a ramp opposite Greenwich on the Thames in London. The ramp could support the Great Eastern's hull, which itself would sit on a kind of cradle. The idea was that once supports were removed, the cradle would move along the tallow-coated ramp's rails and the Great Eastern would slide gently into the river sideways. Now, the launch had to be timed for the perfect tide that would then carry the ship's hull safely away from the banks. And then finally, on November 3rd, 1857, the moment had come. The Great Eastern 692 foot, 210 meter, 12,000 ton hull began to rumble down. But then things went wrong. The ship moved four feet when her way was checked, the launch system failed, and a man was killed by falling timbers. Great Eastern became lodged, unable to move and stranded like some kind of enormous iron whale. Of course, it caused Brunel and his team to be relentlessly mocked, which is especially unfair since Brunel had actually been doing his best to downplay the event, since he must have feared or even suspected that something could go wrong. But amidst the mockery came sympathetic parties, other engineers who wanted to help. They wrote in with ideas and advice. A huge amount of equipment was assembled to actually bodily haul the ship down into the river over the course of two months, and finally, in January 1858, the massive vessel was afloat. It had not only been an embarrassing affair, it had actually cost the ship's backers a small fortune. Great Eastern's failed launch was just the first chapter in an epic and bizarre tale of a ship marred by poor fortunes and strange happenstance. Today, you can actually still visit the launch site because it's been largely preserved at Millwall, London. Now, Brunel had some kind of ill premonition that something about his launch might go wrong, but in the case of this next launch, it was a freak accident that nobody could have seen coming. The SS Daphne of 1883 was a small steamer built in Govan, Scotland, on the Clyde River. She was only about 450 tonnes, designed to run on the regular service to Ireland from Glasgow. It was only a short voyage, so she didn't need to be too large. The ship was only about 178 feet, or 54 metres long. The timeline for delivering ships like this was quite tight, and she was not a vessel of any real prestige, so her launch was seen as little more than a practical affair. Dozens of workmen were aboard doing their jobs to get the ship ready for service when the hull was launched into the river. Now, the idea was for two anchors, one on each side, to check her progress so that she'd come to a rest, but that day something went horribly wrong. The starboard anchor held, but the port anchor dragged, causing the ship to swing wildly around. The river's strong current caught her and hurled the entire thing over onto her side. She capsized and flooded almost immediately, trapping dozens of the workmen on board. The rolling caught them completely off guard and actually threw many up top into the river. One survivor later wrote, I felt the vessel toppling over to the right and in a moment every person on board was hurled into the water. 
The shrieks and cries were terrible. I, along with some others, scrambled onto the bottom of the vessel, which was turned upside down and retained a hold. In a few moments, a man came around with a small boat and asked me to jump into the water. I did so and was rescued. I believe that over 200 people were in the vessel. I cannot possibly describe the heartbreaking scenes which I witnessed. 124 workers, many of them in their 20s or younger, were killed when the Daphne rolled over, causing an outpouring of grief from the tightly knit Glaswegian shipbuilding community, and immediately tough questions had to be asked. An established inquiry surprised all by actually clearing the yard's owners of all blame. And the families and friends of victims were outraged and accused the investigative bodies of a cover-up. Now regardless, the disaster did actually result in reforms that limited the number of personnel that could be aboard ships during a launch and also ensured that heavy equipment and tools were fastened down during the event. The ship's wreck was not actually a write-off, she was eventually salvaged, repaired and put into service as the SS Rose. Today you can actually find two memorials to the Daphne in Govan, even though the disaster has essentially been consigned to the history books and is today little known. Now finally, let's end on a slightly lighter note. This is the launching of the infamous SS Principessa Yolanda, which is actually a ship we've covered on this channel before, but the story doesn't get any less ridiculous every time I tell it. The ship was supposed to represent the very finest of Italian shipbuilding when she was completed and ready for launch in 1907. She was actually the largest passenger vessel yet built in Italy up to that point, and boasted magnificent, luxurious interiors. She was perched high up on the slipway at Riva Trigoso, Dozens of important government officials, dignitaries and businessmen were invited to watch the spectacle, and the usual throng of hundreds and hundreds of onlookers were drawn to the amazing sight. Now, you might notice something unusual about the Principessa. Most ships are launched in an unfinished state. This means that the ship's hulls are at their lightest, they're easier to control and arrest after the launch. Principessa Yolanda's builders, however, decided to mix things up a bit. The ship was virtually completed, with all of her tall external fittings like funnels and masts fixed into position, all of her furniture. The time came, the signal was given, the Principessa Yolanda roared down into the water to the cheers and applause of thousands, and then she immediately rolled over. Now, the ship's mostly completed state was offset by the fact that the ballast, or the weight, deep in the ship's hull designed to balance it all out, had not been taken on. It meant that the ship's centre of gravity, at launch, was very high up and the vessel was a top-heavy white elephant. With a groan, the ship listed and rolled before lying completely flat on her side. Fortunately, the Principessa did so gently, and it gave the captain and those guests aboard time to escape safely in the ship's boats, and nobody was hurt or killed. But the incident was, of course, highly embarrassing. Even worse was the fact that surveyors concluded the ship was a complete write-off. She couldn't be salvaged or repaired, it had taken around two years for the complex, technologically advanced and luxurious ship to be built, but she had lasted just an hour on the water's surface. Lessons were obviously learned, and a future sister ship was launched in the usual unfinished state, but the poor old Principessa Yolanda was broken up for scrap, having travelled just a couple of hundred feet from where she'd been built. Ship launches are an incredible spectacle, but if history tells us anything, it's that the immense physics at play deserve to be respected. Now if you ever get invited to attend a launch of a ship the size of something like the Queen Mary, go ahead and enjoy it, but maybe just make sure to pack a spare change of trousers in case of unexpected tidal waves. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below, or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew! As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.